The theme of this video is to focus not only on certain brands, but also specific genres that I believe are worth your attention, especially now. Before even getting into that area, let's first focus on and address the three big names. The three names that are the most highly received on this platform, Rolex, Omega and Tudor. Where are they at the moment? If you are interested, I did a review video a couple of months back looking at three watches, each linking to this specific brand, and I'll put that video in the corner of the screen now for you. So let's start with Rolex. Nothing's changed. Nothing probably will change. Demand for the watches are still sky high and they still cannot meet the demand and likely won't. I'm not saying that this is a time when you should be deviating away from the brand or looking in other areas. If you have an aspiration to own one of these pieces, by all means, go for it. Like many of us, I think there's something special about getting yourself into the brand. But if your sole intention is to own a Rolex and nothing else will satisfy that want or that interest, then you're missing out on a lot of great opportunities. So keep those aspirations. Don't let go of them. Keep it in the back of your head while still looking around. It's interesting to see that how this demand has increased so many are driven to other brands and look at other manufacturers. And that leads very neatly to Omega. Of course, this hasn't happened overnight. It's been going on for a very long time, but many have been approaching the Omega brand because their watches are superb, excellent value for money, great pieces to experience. But what we have also seen with new releases that have happened quite recently, is that their watches are also in the same kind of ballpark when it comes to demand, when it comes to desire from the broader community. This then means that the watches are going to be harder to come by and so attention has to go into other directions and so it goes. It's almost as if the Rolex and the Omega brands, not only are their prices increasing ever so much, some of their watches are getting harder and harder to find, but many in our watch community are also going into other directions and looking into other genres, which is why I think a video like this is quite pertinent for many of you out there. I also find it a shame that many brands are adopting the same kinds of pricing schemes because they know their watches are in greater demand, so they increase the prices. And then what happens eventually is that people start chancing their arms when it comes to selling them on the gray market. Anyway, in closing, modern Rolex and Omega they're getting harder to find. They are still very expensive. Some are increasing in price, especially with the newer calibers, especially with the newer technologies they are adopting. So moving to Tudor as a brand, it is one of the three, I would say the one of the three, that not only offers excellent value for money, but is also even more attainable at this point in time. Probably your best bet to get a good experience out of a watch without breaking the bank and without feeling exhausted looking for something if you know what I mean. They have an excellent back catalogue, but their modern pieces are just as efficient, well worth your attention. And then if we are to segue into vintage, looking at vintage Omega, Rolex, Tudor, similar kind of situation where the demand for all of them is increasing, prices are going up, and this I believe some brands are approaching very well, which is going to be one of the genres we'll be focusing on. Because these three brands are going in the same sort of direction because of hype and demand, so we are seeing something else, and that is change. We are seeing the release of new watches from completely different brands that are capitalizing on this vacant segment, this unquenched area, this unsatiated zone in the marketplace, where people want certain design attributes and now they can find them. Perfect example is the Zenith Chronomaster Sport. By no means is it an affordable watch, but what it is doing is, as a brand, showing more people, getting more publicity, I should just say, largely a lot more attention. And whether it's good press or bad press, it's still coverage. With that synopsis out of the way, we can look at choices, specific genres that I think you should be paying attention to, especially now. The beauty of these names being held under the spotlight, the attention from the masses going onto them means that you can start looking in completely different areas other directions, at a time when there is no real interest in them so you can start investigating more. If you want to be someone who is not only in it for a certain brand but wants to expand their knowledge a bit more, who wants to experience more, like many of us do, these are the areas that I think we should look at. Of course it is subjective, it's purely opinion based, but let's have some fun. First genre I will call the entry level. What does this mean? Even if you are someone who is experienced, who's been in this hobby much longer than many of us out there, there's always something about going back to your roots or looking into a category that you may never have stumbled on before. 
what we have found time and time again is that it's not only the big names that are introducing new models, new approaches, but the smaller names, the ones that aren't as hype driven are doing the same thing. So I've listed a few bullet points, not really anything too substantial, but Seiko, Hamilton, Casio, micro brands in brackets. Take it from me, I'm a good example. Picked up a Seiko a couple of weeks ago, my first Seiko, and it's been an excellent experience. Not only have I been able to discover their design language a bit more, have a great time wearing the watch, but it's driven me to look at the brand in a lot more detail. But also, if you are new to this hobby, if you've just started out and you want to find something that not only has some horological significance, but also keeps you coming back for more, that gives you that taste and that experience of an automatic watch, then a brand like Hamilton is a good example. Look at the field watch and what it has to offer you. My take on the theme of field watches is that they're pieces that today, I believe, can be treated as both formal and informal. They have the ability of being extremely sport going, sport focused, but at the same time can be worn with suits and ties and fit in any situation. Not only do they hold a lot of history to them, they are small, they can be very discreet and out of the way, but they just make for excellent daily watches that don't require much attention. They don't need much input about choosing what works best. You just throw it on your wrist, get on with your day. Similar kind of zone to brands like Casio. The design of the G-Shock has evolved so much over the last few years, not only through collaborative exercises, but just as a brand, they're taking a much more organic approach when it comes to incorporating industrial design into their image. We've seen some good partnerships, but beyond that, they are starting to look more at the analog marketplace. The idea of owning an analog Casio is very enticing to someone like me, who has never really been into digital watches, but from a functional and manufactured perspective, they're not only fun, but are experimental, something a bit more creative. And that branches to micro brands, which is a theme within itself. Why do I say this? Well, of course, there is an affordability aspect to it, which is very appealing. But beyond that, it is looking at how manufacturers are able to reinterpret DNA, to put their own spin on it, something that the big names aren't willing to do very often. More than ever, we see the big names focus on what made them famous, not so much looking to expand, where the micro brand still needs to try and find its footing in the marketplace, needs to compete. And because we see this competition happening across so many brands, it means that they're always innovating. They're always trying to push the envelope and the boundary. Very much what we saw from the big names 50 plus years ago. We could say that the big names are resting on their laurels while the micro brands are not only trying to catch up, but are actually winning in some areas too. So to reiterate, for someone new to this hobby, the entry level is a great place to start because it's affordable. There's some creative diversity. It also allows you to appreciate the the simplicity of owning a basic watch, getting you to appreciate time in the purest sense. For the experienced, going back to see what new brands are doing, maybe picking up on a name that you haven't looked at in 20 years, or just dipping your toes into another area completely. So the next genre, reissue watches. Now this is a huge segment, and it's incredible, actually. What has this area done? How did it begin, and where is it sitting at the moment? I think in many ways its resurgence has been because of not only the online blogs like Hodinkee and many others, but just the sheer demand for vintage watches that has been driven up over the last few years. I think the recreating of watches offers a lot of opportunity to us out there who simply cannot afford the prices of actual vintage watches in this zone. They allow us to appreciate the aesthetics, but at the same time they are watches that we can actually wear and abuse, use every single day without any worry. For those of you who are new to this page, I have spoken about reissues a lot in the past. It's a category that I greatly appreciate because it really does show you a different side to this industry, a side that is not so much pushed by demand, but more of how brands are able to look to their past and appreciate their own heritage and share that with us. Give us the opportunity to experience the first dive watch they ever made, the first chronograph, some of their most famous chronographs. In this category, I've listed Omega, Glasuta, Breitling, Zenith, Panerai. All of these names, I think, have some very well-established reissue watches that deserve a lot more attention. The appreciation we should have is in trying to understand why these watches were the way they were made back then. The aesthetics were and are still so peculiar 
but it starts conversations. It keeps us invested in a brand and makes us think more about why they didn't keep certain attributes as well. While it's all well and good enjoying the new and shiny things, the modern things, the pieces that are inspired by past references share a different story, shine a different light on the brand, and ultimately lets you explore the depths of their archives and what made these specific models so profound in their time period for their application. This category in particular, reissue watches are becoming more and more profound. It looks like virtually every brand, save a few, are doing the same thing. They're modernizing the sizes, upgrading all of the internal componentry, but keeping the quirks that made them original. In this final genre, I have called Phoenix brands. I use this very lightly, but what I intend to say is they're watches that never necessarily had the spotlight shone on them, but in recent years they have risen from the ashes maybe brands that are getting a lot more attention at the moment. So in this list, I have said Alunga & Zona, Yema, Zodiac, Doxa, Aquastar, some manufacturers out there that we could consider the outliers. You know, another example like H. Moser, names that still don't necessarily have the focus on them, but they are rising through the ranks. Not only making watches that are very specific to their own design language and their own approach, but are ones that haven't necessarily reached the mainstream yet. Now this we can look at regardless of price. There are so many zones within this genre, and it is sort of a culmination of the other two. Within the entry level and the reissue watch space, many of these Phoenix brands are doing just that, offering watches at great prices that are also reissues to an extent, resurgences of their own identities. I also believe that like the micro brand, the Phoenix brand needs to make a statement. It needs to forge its own path. And in doing that, they can be a lot more creative. And in a time when the focus is very much on the rigid, well-constructed, historically significant watches, now might also be a very good time to look at pieces that aren't so well received because they never did scale the mountains or go to space. I guess the main take home point from this video is that there is so much more out there for you to enjoy and to discover. This hobby is a lot more than ownership. It's about finding and appreciating things that maybe others haven't witnessed or experienced themselves. I build on this point looking at watch collecting and why I don't believe it's ever complete. And what I tried to emphasize in that video, which is what I'll do here, is that this hobby is not something about the destination. It's very much journey based. And you are doing yourself a disservice if you think that there is this end goal because the reality is you may not ever get there so instead of driving to your destination and running out of fuel two-thirds of the way there why not stop at a few cafes a few restaurants explore a few places you've never seen before it won't only make the journey all the more worthwhile but the experiences you will gain and the impressions that you get will make you a more rounded owner and collector this unquenched area this unsafe this unquenched segment, this unsatiated, is that even a word? I don't know. Unsatiated <laughs> is a word. This unquenched area, this unsatiated zone in the marketplace where people want certain design attributes.